Well, we are pushing pause on our First Thessalonians series to do uh, and jump into a two-part Christmas series, and I'm excited about it. It's called The Birth of a King. This morning is called B.C. Before Christ, and today we're going to examine an Old Testament prophecy that foretold the birth of Christ, and next Sunday we're going to look at the events surrounding the birth of Christ. So i got a question for you to start off. Have you ever had something happen or a circumstance in your life and you thought, looking back on that today, that God moved, that God directed your steps or the steps of other people and because of his grace and because of his mercy, you had the opportunity or you received or you were protected from I'm sure all of you are filling in the blank with something as you consider and look back on your life, the hand of God moving specifically in a circumstance. And as you look back and you see the tapestry of details woven together in such a way that the evidence of God's hand is unmistakable. Ten years ago, I was finishing up a pastoral internship at a church in in Fullerton. And it was a two-year internship with an end date. And as I got into the process of interviewing and and, and thinking, what's my next step? Applying at other other churches and saying, God, what's next? For some reason, Shanna got pregnant. Um, I I do know how. But uh, Shanna, she was due in July. And the end of the internship was in June. And she was due in July. And in June, my health insurance ended as well with the internship. And so as, you know, an expectant father and mother for the first time with a transition coming up, having a baby, losing, not losing, but an internship ending, needing to find another place to land. We just took care of all the stressors stressors in life except us dying in that one spring and summer. So I'll never forget this though. As we went through, as we went the ups and downs uh, uh, with anxiety and, and understanding that, you know, God's in control, I just don't want to get a, a ministry position just for the sake of getting a wage, just for the sake of getting insurance. But at the same time, that deadline was looming. And so there's that tension that you go through when you go through an upcoming transition. And we went through it. But I'll never forget, on June 15th, my official last day at the church in Fullerton with the internship was the exact day that the pastor at the new church sent me the ministry job agreement to sign. And I was blown away. And all the details and variables that could have happened, the odds of that happening are so slim that I could only do one thing, give credit to where credit is deserved, and that is to God. Now, when you look back, What can you see and what do you see with the evidence around the circumstances in your life that God moved in your life? We all have those. This Christmas we celebrate the birth of Christ and all the details surrounding the birth and those that foretold about the birth and predicted that the birth of Christ was going to come. Now there's simply too much evidence around the prophecies of Christ for it to not have been the work of God. Um, what day is it today? It's December 14th, 15th. What? What's the year? 2013. Okay, based on what? 2013 based on what? Well, we, we label our years, right? This is what we label our years. We, we call it AD 2013 today, right? And... Sometimes you see BC beside it, 2013. What's the difference between those two? Just over 4,000 years, right? Because AD, if you go to the next slide, is Anno Domini, which in Latin means the year of our Lord, and BC means before Christ. And that's the way we have tracked our calendar for 2,000 plus years based on a historical event of Christ coming to earth. Now, it's interesting that Christ was most likely not born at year zero, 
Actually, in our calendar, there is no year zero. It goes from 1 BC to 1 AD. Did you know that? It's kind of interesting when you think about it. And uh, the evidence shows that Christ was probably born around 6 to 4 BC, somewhere in there. I'll share with you those details next week, next Sunday. So come back next Sunday, and uh, we'll get into that. But uh, the Old Testament was written over a thousand-year period. It's the first part of the Bible, and it contains, some scholars say, over 300 prophecies about Christ. Now, I want to help you grasp the significance of all those prophecies. You see, most of those prophecies were written down 500 plus years prior to the birth of Christ. And in Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, he points out that the possibility of just eight prophecies being fulfilled is one chance in 100 million billion. And that number itself is millions of times greater than the total number of people who have ever walked on our planet. And that's simply just eight prophecies. Now Strobel then goes on to quote a mathematician. And he says, the mathematician says, the probability of fulfilling 48 prophecies was one chance in a trillion to the 13th power. Isn't that crazy? It's incredible as you think about that. You see, God is in complete control. And God, his hand was at work when Jesus came to the earth. Because hundreds and even thousands of years prior to Christ showing up, his birth was foretold in incredible details in many prophecies. And if you look on your uh, sermon outline, if you want to pull that out, I've included a few of these prophecies. I want to encourage you this week to read about those, read, read the scripture where they are for fulfilled in the New Testament, and take time to read and discuss that with your family, and even spend some time in prayer to God and thanking him that he is in control. He's in control of this event and he's in control and we can trust him with our own lives. Now this morning we're going to look at one of the earliest prophecies in scripture that foretold not only the coming of Christ but it answers why Christ came. And I want to invite you to turn to Genesis uh, chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 15. Genesis 3, uh, verse 15. If you got your Bibles, turn to that. If you got your smartphone, if you want to open up your app and, and uh, scroll to Genesis 3, 15. Now, this is the first promise given after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. It's also the first gospel sermon ever preached on the face of the earth. Theologians call it the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel. These words spoken to God, uh, by God are spoken to the serpent or Satan. And they contain the earliest promise of redemption in the Bible. Everything else in scripture flows from this one verse. And it has been referred to as the sum and the summary of the whole Bible in this one verse. Pretty incredible. So I want to invite you. Let's read this verse together. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. And uh, we're going to read this verse together as we stand to our feet. Just in honor of the Lord and thanking him uh, by standing for his word. So Genesis 3.15, it's on the screen as well. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Amen. You may be seated. Powerful verse. Number one, first point is endless conflict. The the text says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. The key word is enmity. Everybody say enmity. It, It means hostility, animosity, anger. Now one translation says, I will set a feud. Another puts it this way, there will be a war. The New Living Translation says, you and the woman will be enemies. And note that God himself takes responsibility for this enmity. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. You see, the serpent was cozying up to Eve prior to this. Do you remember? You remember the story? And deceived her and she ate of the fruit. But God put enmity between her and the serpent. And this is telling us that that Eve and the devil will never get along. If the devil thought that by deceiving her and cozying up to her, that he, that he had her in his back pocket, he was greatly mistaken. Eve sinned, but she would never join the serpent's fan club. Now the deeper meaning lies in the word the NIV translates as offspring. In the Hebrew, the word is seed. 
referring to the generations yet unborn. That seed or offspring refers to the men and women of faith throughout the generations who have believed in God. And then it's obvious as well that Satan has his offspring too, as the text says, throughout history in every generation, in every country, in every city, in every village, every tribe, in many families, Satan is working and has his plan to draw you and me away from God or to keep people who don't believe in the Lord, who aren't Christians, to keep them blind from God. So as a believer, there will always be conflict. There will always be enmity between you and me and Satan as he tries to deceive us as he did in the garden with Eve and to turn us away from God. Number two, temporary defeat. God then says uh, at the end of the passage, he says, you will strike his heel. If uh, anybody ever have uh, heel pain before, I've had it once. Uh, I remember I walked too far in flip-flops and then I, I limped for about a week. Um, if you've ever had a heel spur or, you know, uh, pulled your Achilles tendon, you know how painful this can be. What happens? You end up on crutches. You end up uh, taking painkillers and, and hobbling around trying to, to make life happen. Heel trouble slows you down, but it doesn't kill you. You can live with heel problems even though you have to hobble and struggle with them. Now, when our text says you will strike his heel, it refers to the fact that in this life, Satan sometimes wounds and sometimes seems to win the fight. Never the battle, but he can seem, it can seem like he's winning the fight. He has many tools in his arsenal. Ephesians 6, it talks about how he has flaming arrows that he shoots at believers, and he does that 24 hours a day. Have you ever woken up stressed or afraid or anxious in the middle of the night? You get what I'm saying. It's interesting that according to WebMD, the most frequent cause of heel pain is not the result of a single injury, but the repetitive, excessive heel pounding. I think that is so true because sometimes we're wounded by excessive discouragement, repetitive criticism, unbridled anger in our own heart, bitterness in our own heart, and perhaps by plans and dreams that simply go astray or do not work out that we wanted to come to fruition. And this verse reminds us that we'll be wounded, that life isn't a bed of roses. Not only is there continual conflict, but Satan can inflict pain, physical, emotional pain. And the evil one uses repetitive and excessive blows to break us down. Now when Christ died on the cross, Satan struck a part of his foot. Where on his body were the nails pounded in? In his hands, and his, and his feet. But Friday, about sundown, when they took the body of Christ off the cross, it appeared that Satan had won. But what happened three days later? He rose from the dead. The victor got out of the grave alive and rose from the dead. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Praise God. He rose from the dead. He didn't stay there. Satan did not win. Satan delivered a terrible blow to Jesus on Good Friday. No doubt he thought it was a knockout punch, but it wasn't. He was wrong. All he did was strike Jesus in his heel. Number three, eventual victory. The text says he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The text says that there will be enmity between the offspring or seed of Eve and Satan. But then the language changes from the many to the specific, from the people of God and their conflict with Satan to a person and what this person will do to Satan, to the serpent. And it says, he will, this person will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is a specific prophecy that foretells the coming of Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one set apart to come and redeem those who would receive his free gift of salvation. And this describes Christ's striking relationship with Satan. Nobody laughed in the first service either. Did you get that? His striking relationship with Satan? Are you with me? Okay, yeah. Uh, low humor. Uh, heel wounds. Heel wounds are painful, but they don't kill you. 
No one survived a cr survives a crushed head. Okay? If you get a major wound in your head, you're in trouble. The cross was God's death blow to Satan. Now that's an interesting phrase. I've heard that a lot around church. I've heard that a lot from different people. But I have a question for you. Was the cross a death blow against Satan? Well, this is a quick tangent, but, but it's a great question to, to ask because I hear that comment all the time. You see, Satan is still active today, isn't he? Absolutely. And he will be until, Scripture says, he will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur for eternity. Does not sound like a fun place to be. I don't recommend it. But that's where he is going, and Scripture says, I wrote that down, Matthew 25, 41, Revelation 20, 10 refers to that lake where Satan will be thrown. Now, we often hear that language that Satan, uh, Christ destroyed Satan at the cross. But it sounds like, when we use that language, that, you know, Jesus and Satan were in this epic battle, duking it out, going a few rounds, and then Jesus finally won at the cross. But the reality is, is that there is a battle between the people of God and Satan and his minions. But is there a battle between Jesus and Satan? Well, let me try and describe that quote unquote battle in terms that we might be able to better understand. Imagine a thousand Marines trained, armed to the hilt, ready to go to battle. They come to a battlefield. They know the enemy is coming and they're there to destroy the enemy, to fight. They're willing to lose their life for this battle and destroy the enemy, okay? And this battle is looming and then off in the distance, they see the enemy coming and then finally it gets close enough. They can make it out and they see the enemy and they're ready to attack a fluffy baby kitten, Is that a battle? Meow. <laughs> no, that's not a battle. Satan is like a little weak, fluffy kitten compared to the strength of God. And that doesn't even describe how strong God is. But there is no battle between God and Satan. There's a battle between us and Satan. He is, he's our enemy. Now, Hebrews 2.14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Some people use this verse and say, he destroyed him. The Greek can also mean he rendered him powerless. And that's what Christ did on the cross. Satan is powerless at influencing God's plan of redemption for you and me. He's powerless when we receive God's grace, when we take and receive the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ, Satan is powerless to do anything about that for nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, amen? amen. All right, let's look at some application. Number one, the Christian life will always be a struggle. Struggle implies effort. Struggle implies sweat, exertion, and difficulty. That's why the Apostle Paul uses the, the image of a runner, of a boxer, of a wrestler, and of a soldier to describe the Christian walk. You see, the Christian walk isn't easy. It's hard work and it demands your full commitment. It demands my full commitment and full engagement of all we are. That's why the, the famous scripture says, love the Lord with all your what? Heart, soul, mind and strength with all you are determined to be fully devoted to Christ no matter how hard it gets it's not supposed to be easy we're at war with Satan and he's at war against us he wants to break us down and keep us distracted and we need to remember that our battle isn't against flesh and blood Ephesians 6 12 says this but our battle is against Satan who wants to distract us from following the Lord and loving the Lord well around our family, friends, co-workers in our community. Satan wants to deceive you and me and keep us from trusting and living for God. Life is hard. Sometimes times are difficult, especially at this time of year when you want everything to be perfect, a perfect Christmas. We have these big expectations, but you know what? As I mentioned last week, if you were there at the, the, the Christmas uh, celebration with the choir last Sunday night, it's hard when our ideal in our own mind for an ideal Christmas runs smack into the real 
of our life situation. And it's hard to process that. But you know what? We all have the ideal, but we have to deal with the real. You see, salvation is free, but nobody gets to heaven without some wounds, without some pain, without some struggles. Nobody gets to Christmas Day in a week and a half without wounds and struggle as well. How many of you have struggled during this Christmas season so far? I know I have, especially relationships and you need to get, there's so many tasks to get done and so much relationship, warm fuzzies to make happen and doing it all is hard. It, it, that's just the reality of it. Number two, our victories will not come without wounds. Our victories will not come without wounds. If Jesus suffered in doing the will of God, so will we. Second Timothy 1a, join with me in what? Suffering for the gospel. God allowed Jesus to be bruised by Satan. I kind of like that. I kind of like that, that phrase because the cross, when we think about it in our humanity, how brutal it was, it was just a bruise. It was just a bruise. And what, what happens with bruises? They eventually heal. Yeah, they go away. They heal. Did Christ get healed from that bruise? Absolutely. He rose from the dead. That's why we celebrate Easter. It's the healing of a bruise. And that reminds me of how sometimes kids mock each other. And I know I, I did it as a, uh, as a kid. You know, I would say, well, that didn't hurt. Try harder. That didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. Punch me harder. Punch, that didn't hurt. And it's kind of like God's mocking Satan saying, cross didn't hurt. It was just a bruise. Come on, Satan. That didn't hurt. You didn't hurt me. Now, Here's the hard reality though. If Jesus suffered in his humanity for doing the will of God, so will we. And even after his resurrection, his body bore the marks of his suffering. He was healed, but his body bore the marks of his suffering. You will struggle big time in this life and you will be wounded. You may heal from your wounds over time, but the physical and emotional scars may remain with you. But don't despair because Life is hard. That's the reality. Struggle on and be thankful in the struggle. Remember that God is in charge and if you feel like running away from your struggles, remember that there is nowhere to run. Every corner of this planet, you're gonna run into struggle. If you leave the battlefield today, you're gonna wake up and find yourself in another battlefield tomorrow. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be self-controlled and... What does it say? Be self-controlled and alert. alert. Your enemy, the devil, turn to your neighbor right now and tell them, you're not my enemy. That's the truth. That is the truth. Whether you feel that or not is irrelevant. Those are just feelings. We're all grown-ups. We don't go with our feelings, right? That was kind of a joke too, right? Because we do too often. <laughs> but we shouldn't. Be self-controlled and, and alert. Who's our enemy? Your enemy, the yeah. devil, prowls around like a, lo a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. How do we resist him? By what? Read it with me. Standing firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. I know it hurts. I know this person hurts your feelings. I know they were inconsiderate. But don't throw out your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Don't be surprised when temptations and trials come. But stand firm in your faith when they do. Number three, God's plan of salvation is wrapped in a person. Genesis 3.15 is the first mention of Christmas in the entire Bible. Jesus is the seed of the woman who would one day make his entrance into the world in a most unlikely fashion. You might have missed it because the name Jesus isn't in this verse, but he is there. He is the seed of the woman. When the promise was given, no one could have predicted a baby boy in Bethlehem. The reference to her seed is very interesting in Hebrew because the male is the one considered who has the seed. Children are normally referred to as the offspring of the father, not of the mother. So why does it say her seed in this text or her offspring here, I think it's because it's predicting the virgin birth. When the Messiah, when Christ was born, 
he was the offspring of the woman because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.18, it says, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, let's read the rest together, she was found to be with child through Joseph, through the mailman, through the Holy Spirit. Christ didn't come in the usual way. He came by means of a miraculous virgin birth. When God wanted to save the world, he sent the offspring of a woman. When God wanted to say, I love you to you. John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world. That means you. That means me. That means everybody around us. For God so loved the world that he wrapped his love note in swaddling clothes. When God wanted to render Satan powerless over the lives of those who would believe, he started in a stable in Bethlehem with the humble birth of a king. Jesus didn't come only to render Satan powerless, but to deliver us and to show us in how he lived his life. And we're so blessed to have four gospels from four different writers who saw how Christ lived his life and they chronicled it for us to read. So we can learn how to live a new way and be followers of Christ. Christ wants to change us from the inside out. He offers each of us a gift, a gift that was wrapped back in Genesis 3, 15. Just like we need to on, on Christmas morning, I don't know what you guys do in your house, in my house, uh, when the family gathers around to, to open presents at the present opening time, uh, usually there's one designated person to hand out those presents. And some of us fight for that position because it's a, a, a position of honor. You get to touch all the presents and, and get to control who gets what's next and kind of withhold a little bit to watch somebody suffer and, and then finally give it to them. It's just a lot of fun and, and you can, you know, power. Power with passing out presents. But listen, when a present is handed to us from under the tree, you need to take it, right? For it to become yours. You need to take it. You need to reach out your hand and you need to take it. You need to unwrap it and you need to own it. And the same thing. You know, we can, we can talk about the gift that Christ offers us, but until we choose to take it, until we choose to get beyond just intellectually understanding that Christ died on the cross, but that that intellectual understanding moves to our heart, moves to our hands, and moves to our feet, despite the wounds that we have in our life, have we really taken it? Have you really taken the gift that he offers you? And God calls us, as the body of Christ, to be messengers of that gift to our community around us and to never stop working towards loving our community unconditionally so that they may come and share stories, you know, of kids getting new pairs of shoes and us sending volunteers and just loving on them relationally and just modeling Christ. That's our job. Our job isn't to get people saved and to force people to receive the gift. That's not our job. You can't force people to do that. We're called to love and be messengers. God always works in conjunction, though, with response, our response. He has so much to give you this morning, but you need to receive what he has in order to fully benefit from the gift. To put it another way, Jesus was bruised and broken for you. When he died on the cross, he provided a way for you to experience forgiveness of your sins and to experience eternal life in heaven with your heavenly father. But it's not automatic. You need to receive that gift yourself into your life. John 1.12 it says, yet to all who, what's the word? Yet to all who received him. To those who, what's the word? It's your choice to believe. It's your choice to receive Christ. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And if you are not a Christian, if you're not a Christ follower, my question for you is, are you ready to receive him? His offer stands every day and he's patient with you. How do I know he's patient with you? Because he hasn't smited you yet. You have breath in your lungs. You have a beating heart and he's sustaining that. He's not gonna force you to come to him because he loves you. Love is a free will choice that he gave you. 
Will you receive him today? And, and how you do that is simply admit that you're not perfect, that you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins in general and your specific sins. You could name them to God. He knows them already. And then C is choose to follow Christ. Choose to make Christ your king, okay? Not mommy and daddy anymore. Not your spouse. Your spouse makes a bad king. Amen? <laughs> your spouse makes a bad God. Okay? Your children are not your king. Did you hear me say that? Whoa, I stepped across the line maybe because even as a father, that's hard. Like Chad talked about his daughter, you know, having him wrapped around her finger. It's so true. But you know what? God is our king. God is our king. We need to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So let me pray for you and I encourage you this season, accept the best gift you could ever accept is salvation in Christ that he offers freely to you. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the prophecies that, that were fulfilled in Christ. Thank you, God, that you offer a gift to us that doesn't cost us anything. It costs your son his life and his humanity, but in his divinity, it's just a bruise. <laughs> I love that. And, and God, we're all bruised. We're all broken. And this Christmas season, sometimes this time of year is like a magnifying glass on all those bruises and brokenness. And I pray that as our emotions get caught up in that, that we wouldn't make our emotions our God and our King, but that we would continue to make you our King by getting into the Word of God and following what you call us to do and be about. God, thank you for your word. And I'll